seated in the presence of the Lord. Wow, what an awesome time we're having in the presence of the Lord. Do you agree with me? Amen. Amen. I think we had such an awesome time in worship and I was really, you know, I said you can't wear makeup when you come to the house of the Lord because it just all gets messed up. Because it's not makeup anymore, it's messed up. But God is good this morning and I want to greet you all in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Um, I always like to say that it's only by the grace of God that we are here today. Somebody did not have the opportunity to get up today and you have the opportunity because it's only by the grace of God that we are here today. I'm feeling a bit nervous, I don't know why, <laughs> but um, God knows, God is in the house, His presence is in the house. i just like to also just make an announcement for those, um, Brother Luke just asked me also, um, if you're planning on registering for the next Bible Word School class, which is Foundations for Kingdom Living, then you need to, you can speak to Brother Luke on my right, Brother Luke Edson. He has registration forms so that you may have an idea of how many people are registered for the next school starting on the 4th of May. Okay? And this is a powerful, powerful word school. So I want you to, you know, there's nothing that can transform your life like the word of God. So you need to register. If you're not in word school, please register for word school. We're having an awesome time there. At the end of the service, uh, Brother Luke will have that at the back. Um, yes, it's a good day to give praise to the Lord. Are you really, really grateful that God is in your life today? And um, I'm just so in awe of what God is doing, but also so mindful of the time that we are living in. And, um, you know, I said, Lord, you know, many people look at me and then um, uh, Bradley said to me this morning, uh, he calls me Prof, and he said, Prof, I can see you ready to, you know, uh, preach the word of God. I said, I'm not going to be, I'm, I hope I'm not going to be heavy this morning. I just want to, um, you know, you also want to be able to, and I, I, I believe that I'm not here to entertain you, I'm here to bring the word of God to you. And that's what it's about, because the hour that we're living in is a very critical hour that we are living in. I was thinking, you know, for years, we've been, for, we've 21 years into democracy, and for 21 years, we thought South Africa was exceptional. Do you agree with me? We always thought we, you know, the bees knees. We came through, you know, that we, we birthed the new democracy. It was all up to us, and the world said, wow, look at South Africa. And we also thought we were exception, exceptional. But I want to say to you today, we are not okay. South Africa is not okay. The church is not okay. The world is not okay. Like Pastor said earlier, as he spoke, he said, you know, the church, uh, the world is bleeding at this time. South Africa is bleeding at this time. And I want to say to you today that, um, you know, if there's ever a time that even the world out there is looking at the church and the world out there, I don't know if you have unsaved friends and people out there that don't serve God, they are asking what's happening. They're looking at us and they say, but what's happening? They can sense that there's something about the hour that is happening right now. And I want to say to us this morning that, you know, there is a day coming. And this is the hope that we have that Jesus is coming back soon and very soon. Very soon we're going to see that God is going to open and split open the eastern sky. And Jesus will come for those that belong to him. And I want to say we don't need to worry, we don't need to fret, but at the end of the day we are still here to do and to occupy and to do what God has called us to be and that is to be salt and that is to be light. Is there anybody that is excited about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that is coming soon? The Bible says that when you see these things happening around you, it says look up, okay? Uh, the 
church is like a, a, somebody that is in a coma. You know, you're alive, but you can't really, you're not aware of what's going on around you. And many times the Word of God says what we are experiencing right now is the beginning of birth pains. It's the beginning of birth pains. Now anybody who knows birth pains, when a lady's in, in labor, what is the birth pains that you're experiencing? The birth pains is the discomfort. It's the pressure of that baby wanting to come forth. Alright? But many times I believe the church has asked for an epidural. Do you know what's an epidural?
Do you see how strategic the enemy is? We need to be awake, people. We need to be praying like never before. Because right here, right here, right here in the streets of Stephen, we have enemies. Because the enemy is not happy what's happening right here at New Hope. There's the seed of revival in this church. There's the seed of revival in this church. The enemy wants to kill off the seed of revival. He's always after the seed. Because there's the seed of revival in this church and the time has come for us as the church to awake out of our sleep to arise to activate the gifts and the callings of god in our life and to advance the purpose of god because the bible says that the kingdom of god suffers violence but the violent take it by force and it's no good for us to come here and come here week after week but we are actually you know we're calling for revival but let me tell you revival is not a series of meetings a revival is not a campaign a revival is not an opening when we say revive it's dead things that need to be revived god doesn't dwell in lost temples god dwells in living temples and you and I need to be revived and this morning my word may sound serious to you this morning but today I'm here to preach on a formula for revival we're here to speak about what is the formula for revival before we can even preach to those sitting out in the bars those sitting out in the taverns those who are addicted the living church of God needs to be revived. Not the unsaved needs to be revived. You and I need to be revived. I said to the world school the other night, I said when you, if you wonder, you know, I said if you want something to happen in your life and you want to be revived, then you've got to release yourself in worship. It's no use coming and standing and I'm wanting God to do awesome things. And he sang the beautiful chorus earlier. We said, uh, the song that says, I surrender all. I surrender all. But yet when we have the opportunity in the house of God to surrender all, do we surrender? Do I release myself in worship? Do I say, I can't care who's beside me, but I need to have a touch from God. I need to get in touch with God. If you want something to happen in your life, release yourself in worship. Release yourself, give yourself over to God in worship and allow God. But this morning, I want to speak to us this morning and I want to say, Church of God, we have the seed of revival and Pastor Street preached last week the encouraging word of divine transfer. And I believe you were ignited to go out there this week and become a divine transfer. Did you go out and become a divine transfer this week? Okay. Did you realize that you were a carrier of the presence of the Holy One? God needs you and I to arise. God needs us to be carriers of the Holy Spirit. But if we are not aware that we carriers of the Holy Spirit, we will not be able to make a divine transfer in somebody else's life. So this morning, we may want revival in our land. But revival will not start until the church of God, until those of us that are Christians become revived again. What does it mean revival? Re means again, okay? And revive, I think the word is, is verbera, means to live again. So I want to say to you and I as Christians, if you are in a coma this morning, if you have become comatose as a Christian, if you are on an epidural this morning, if you have gone to sleep this morning spiritually, then I want to say to you, Church of the Living God, it's time for us to live again. It's time for us to become alive again. I'd like you to turn your Bibles with me to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 7. Verses 14. There is no other formula for revival. There
in 2 Chronicles 7 verses 14. Where God says, and thou shalt remember 
all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to test thee to know what was in thy heart whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or not and he humbled thee and allowed you to get hungry so he could feed you with manna which thou know you must not neither did thy fathers know that ye might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the Lord doth man live so God has to take us through a humbling process sometimes he has to turn off and shut off our resources shut off our resources shut off the blessings he said the reason why I took you through 40 years of wilderness was the first thing he says was to humble you. To humble you. The first thing. And I got news for some of us. God is going to have to humble us. It's just how quick are we going to realize that this is a process that God is putting me through because he wants to humble me. Guess what? Why is he wanting to humble me? He wants me to realize that man does not live by bread alone. Man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word that proceeds. And he said, I wanted to test you because I wanted to see what was in your heart. God wants to see, you know, I don't want to be a spear wheel in your life. Just when you sick, then you want to call on man. Just when you don't have food in your cupboard, when things go tough, and then you want to call on me. I'm going to need to test you and know what's in your heart. Because I'm a jealous God. I'm jealous. I created you for my glory. And I want you to be an, exib an exhibit, an exhibition of my glory. But if I can't get that, I'm going to humble you. I'm going to put you through some difficult times so that God can humble you and put so the first condition, the first condition, the formula for revival is if my people, that's me Lord, called by my name, that's me Lord, will humble themselves, come low before God, realize my dependence is solely on God, that besides God, I can do nothing. Nothing in my life will work if I don't become dependent. If I don't realize that every word that proceeds from the word of God, I've got to live on that. I don't live by Gatsby's. I don't live by KFC. I don't live by restaurants. I don't live by spur. I live by every word that proceeds. That's dependence. That's dependence. And he said, do you remember that Jesus suffered? Jesus suffered the only Son of God and to suffer on the cross of Calvary. The Bible said he learned obedience through his suffering. So many of us are going to have to come to a place of obedience, but God is going to put us through some suffering. And that's not what we want, okay? We want the comfort trip. We want the, the ticket to heaven. We want the blessings. We want the blessings. So first point, believers, this morning, this word is for us. Humble ourselves. All right? The second process for revival, what does it say? We got um, Second Chronicles, verses 7, 14. If my people who will humble themselves, what's the next one? Pray. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Okay? There is a process to a revived heart. There is a process to a revived heart. The process is prayer. But a prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. No prayer, no power. And I'm afraid to say that we're going to have to seek God in this time. We're going to have to Who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. 
right? Humble themselves and pray. What is the enemy of revival? Pride is an enemy of revival. Prayerlessness is also the second enemy of revival. Prayerlessness is the second enemy of revival. Prayerlessness is the first cousin to pride. Sure. Did you know that? Oh. Prayerlessness is the first cousin of pride. So guess what? If you're not praying, you probably got some pride in your life because you think you can do it on your own. Yeah. Don't need God. Okay, you can do this thing on my own, earn enough money and do, you know, go ahead. Prayerlessness is the first cousin to pride. It is the fact that we can have prayer and not have revival. We can come in here and pray and pray and pray and still not have revival, but we will never have a revival apart from prayer. When you pray, you're telling God, I cannot do this thing on my own. When you pray, you are telling God, I am dependent on you. I cannot make it. I cannot step out of my door this morning because I need to be covered. How many of us get up? Do everything. Take our bags. Make sure the Lord, first thing we make sure that wallet is on us before we go. But how many of us, especially the ladies, Take some time doing the makeup, making sure everything, and we give ourselves, you know, checks. How many checks before we leave? But how many of you are dressed in the spirit? Make sure that you spend the same amount of time dressing yourself in the spirit. Dressing yourself in the spirit so that you're armed and dangerous as you go out. Armed and dangerous. Okay? Prayer is the first statement of our inability. We say, Lord, I am nothing. I am nothing. I am nothing. I want to say to us, we, 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 the time is going to come when we got to at least start spending more time than five minutes and ten minutes in God's presence. We're going to have to spend, get up some earlier Christians and we're going to pray. If you're going to see prayer pray, change in your own life, you're going to have to pray. If you're going to see change in your family, you're going to pray. Some things do not, some demons do not flee without prayer and fasting. Some demons are there because they've been made comfortable for many, many, many years. Through prayerlessness. And if you want to see them flee, then you're going to have to come and pray. And you're going to have to fast so that God can remove the strongholds that is besetting us. For this area as a church, we're going to have to not pay the price. We're going to have to pray the price for many people that are tied up in this area. As a church, we're going to have to pay the price. Because there's people tied up in chains, bondages, crying out. Take a walk out here and this time is going to come. We're going to, like Bradley says, we said we're going into the highways and to the byways. Why don't they come into church? They don't see a light any longer. They don't see a light any longer. We're supposed to be a city on a hill. We were leaving the waterfront on Friday night. And as we left on the freeway, I don't know if any of you have seen the Queen Mary II birthed in Cape Town Harbour. Anybody seen that ship? It's the most majestic sight that you can see laying in that harbour. If you want to see, I think it left 6 o'clock last night, so you won't have to be able to see it. But it is the most majestic sight. I said, Pastor, there, there is a city lying in the water. There is a city lying in the water. I don't know how many floors, but that is a city. Let me tell you, it made the skyscrapers in Cape Town look like this. And that is a floating city. God calls us to be a city on a hilltop. What are we looking like? A shanty town? Yeah. We're looking like a couple of shacks put together. Highball believers. Like Paul Kupai would say, Highball was the money. Highball believers and convenience. God is looking for a 
church. But he's gathering a remnant in this church. Yes. He's gathering a remnant in this yes. church. There's a seed and you can be part of that. Yes. All you need to do, decide is to activate the divine deposit that was made in you. There's a divine assent. Talk to the word class the other night and I said, there are gifts and there's callings within your life. And up to now, you have not even done anything about the gift and the calling. Some of you are so powerful, you don't even know it. Some of you are so powerful, you don't even know it. You could set your family free, you could set just with the words that come out of your mouth. Just with the words that come out of your mouth. Powered by the Holy Spirit. Powered by the Holy Spirit. I want to say to you, we are a city on a hilltop. We the city, we like that ship line in Cape Town Harbor when you take the freeway and just like, oh my word, what is this? That's what God has called us to be. And then right down Concert Boulevard, just, we need ch cars to stop. We need people to stop. And say, what do I see is taking place on the pavement? Why do my feet feel as if they're shaking on this pavement? Yeah. Why do I feel my feet is walking to the direction of that church door? Because the anointing is transferable. The anointing is transferable. And I pray in the day that we live that each of us will become activated with the power that is in us. The Bible says now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly far above what you can think and far above what you can imagine. Stretch your capacity to know that the greater one lives in you. Don't have your own mind, have the mind of Christ. Don't have your own power, have Christ's power living in you. It's the same power that raised Christ from the dead that lives in you. And I pray that right now that the Holy Spirit will be speaking to those of us that sit under this word, that sit under the word every week, every week, but are never, always stirred but never changed. to Christ. So what we're going to have to do, every major revival took place because there was a man or a woman that decided to stand in the gap to pray. To pray. Not pray one hour, not pray two hours. Pray three to four hours a day so that revival can break out in community. So I did desire that as Christians we may, you know Jonah, the message of Jonah, God sent Jonah to the city, city of Nineveh because God saw and said judgment is coming against the city. But in that city, God wanted to save the people of Nineveh. But guess who was the problem? Jonah? Who's the problem today? We are the problem. God wanted to save an entire city. But Jonah was running. And Jonah didn't want to do it. We are like that. We either don't think anything of what God has placed within our lives, that He died and He paid the price. And God is calling us to turn from our wicked ways so that He can save our families, save our communities, save our city. I'd like to go on to the third process this morning of revival. What is the third one? It says, If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face. And Brother Donovan says, yes, not my hands. Are we here this morning just for the benefits, just the hands of Jesus Christ? And you know what? Seeking takes time. You want to seek something with a Bible says, if you seek me, you will find me. But when you seek me with your whole heart, you're going to have to seek God in this you're going to have to look for Him, search for Him. Seek Him, seek me. Come after me. Come after me. Spend time with me. Spend time with me. Seek me. Seek my face. The word seek means to search out by any method, especially by worship and prayer. The word seek my face means to reveal first to the countenance, to turn toward his direction. As people of God, we call to make God our primary focus. But the problem that we have is our 
priority is our own wisdom. Our first priority is not God. Our first priority is anything else but God. If you say seek the kingdom, make seeking the kingdom your first priority. Because now, you know, my work is my first priority, brother and sister. I mean, that puts food on the table. So guess what? So God is going to treat you the same way? And He's not going to make you a priority because that's how you treat Him? Because everything else is number one besides seeking His face. What does the Bible say in Matthew? Is it um, seek Him first? The kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Some people even have a limit on how many hours they will allow themselves in the presence of God even to come to church or week. Do you know that? If I've done my two hours, don't brother, don't ask me for more. Are you crazy? I've got so much work to do. Guess what? If it wasn't for God, you would not have that work. Yes. And perhaps yes. God will have to humble you at some time. Yes. So when the humbling comes, don't come for prayer, brother. We have told you already. We brought the word. Tell your neighbor it's tight. But it's right. Okay? So right now it might be awkward, it may be a bit tight, but it's right. We need to get our house in order. The time has come. God is looking for a remnant. God never gives, you know. Um, I was in a very strange this past week and I'm just thinking. God always uses a remnant. And in the, the word is part of the word that says, wide is the gate, right? That leads to where? And narrow is the gate that right, that the other few are on it. Correct? I know some of you know that. And this past, you know, there is currently an investment scheme going around. Kind of, and I don't, I'm not going to mention the investment scheme. But um, some leaders and pastors are promoting the investment scheme and encouraging people to get into this investment scheme. And I said, you know, this thing is not right uh, because fine if you do it in your personal capacity, but don't get the church of God involved in these things. But because the love of money and the greed is all around, people are being swallowed up and guess what? The Bible says you either serve mammon or you serve God. Because money is like a monster. Right? And God equates that. The Bible equates that. And so people have been because, guess what? The greatest testimony I can tell you, brother, I made a hundred thousand in three months. What are you going to do? You're going to join me. You're going to come along and say, yes, but I can see you looking wealthy as it looks like, you know, and you made that. And I was so disturbed my spirit and I said you know I spoke to my husband and I said God you know when God places something in you and I said I prayed about this thing I prayed and I said how does one how does one because pastors or even gullible being pulled into this thing how does one warn people you know because yeah you always can't go to everybody and whatever but on Friday night, as we normally have our date night on a Friday night. <laughs> so don't disturb on a Friday night. <laughs> so we don't normally, we just, you know, decide anyway, wherever we are, we are just going to, it's not kind of, you know, just have something just to share around the table. You know, go out and spend time. So we dropped the gardener in Hub Bay. And so the easiest thing would be to have nice fish on the rocks and right, or have something and um, he says, no, let's just go around it because we saw the traffic was piled up on Constantia Nick, so we were never going to get out of Hard Bay. Let's go around the campsite. And this is at past six. I mean, this is an early, 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 right? So we're driving around there, no idea, and he says, let's go to the waterfront. And yeah, it's not exactly the way you're going to eat on the water, but I didn't know what I feel like because I just don't feel like eating much. And as we get um, 
to the waterfront. We're walking and I thought, can we just stop in there because there'll be some beach out there and people think, you know, even if you don't have the cash, let's just feel, feel it. So um, we're doing that and then I said, okay, I don't know, but let's go. We wanted to go for some fish, but let's go to um, past, there's some places like Key for and all these places. And I said, no, okay, the Key for the tavern, it's probably going to be too much drinking going on there. Let's go right across now to a town fish market and just go there. And you know, this is at half past six now. I mean, what other people have dinner that early on a Friday night since half past six. And as we step into the, it's a massive restaurant, we step into the restaurant and I'm like caught in the distance, I see a long table set. And the table is set there and I'm like, oh my God, that looks like a friend of ours sitting there, but now I'll just move on because I mean it's rude now just to go and look. And then I sit in a spot, there's another friend of mine sitting, what's going on here? How come we are here? How come we are here and all of them are friends, but why are we not with them? <laughs> Why didn't we get an invitation? <laughs> but we said we weren't sure it wasn't like a little settled, settled up. My goodness, in a minute or so they came over to us and said, wow, how shocking that you were here. The same place that all of us had chosen at half past six on a Friday. Who would not know that? Please come over and come and join us. And we said, no, 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 we don't want to join the young and crashing now. I mean, surely what is this event about? This must be a reason for this. Well, this is the reason brought it out. There's absolutely something adversary here or something. And I said to my husband, something is a sin of God wants us to open our mouths here. And I'm telling you, we had an opportunity because the kingpins of this thing were sitting there and they was because they asked us, so why aren't you? And then we had an opportunity to with our opinions and threw out that long table there. It wasn't a popular thing to do, but if you ask me, I'm going to tell you now why I'm not involved in this scheme. Because I don't believe we are called in the last day. People are burning and you selling investment schemes and getting other Christians to invest in schemes. I believe you need to be true to the call that God has called you to. If God calls you to preach the word, then preach the word. I would be suspect, I would think that you're getting together here to have a revival to pray for the sake of our city, not to be seeing how you can enrich yourself, yeah. you know. And we had an opportunity. I said to my husband, but how did God set this up? Of all the places that you and I, we don't even feel like I'm there. Why are they so far? Anyway, it's good enough. But God, when you pray about a matter, and I took it into my spirit, and I said, Lord, I'm unhappy about this. I'm unhappy about this, and I'm praying about this thing. But God do something. And God puts us in the midst of those people. Yes. To come and raise up a standard and say, I. You see, the enemy is out to defile the church. The enemy is out to defile the enemy. So the Bible says in the last days, how do we, how must we walk? Circumspectly. Circumspectly. Carefully. Carefully. Because the Bible says that if these days be not shortened, What's going to happen? The very elect, the holiest of the holies are going to fall. We saw a man of God there that was in his 60s. A bishop. One of the most conservative bishops. I believe this bishop is there. must be the last days. <laughs> Bring back 
that God wants us to be turned from the wicked ways. Turn from the wicked ways. What must we do? We must repent. We must repent. When it says, I surrender all, we got to call a solemn assembly and we say for the next week and the next month, all the church is going to do is repent. All we're going to do is repent. We're just going to come. We're not going to pray for the world. We're not going to pray. We're just going to repent and turn from our wicked ways. We're going to turn from the things that are sitting in us. We're going to say, Lord, purge us. Because what God needs is purity and righteousness. Purity. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. We are not tombs of the Holy Spirit. We are temples. A tomb has got dead things in it. We are living temples of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to realize we cannot sit here and think that we are saved and we've got the pass to go to heaven. The Bible says when these things happen, Pray that you will not enter into temptation. Pray that you will not enter into temptation. Seek God so that when the trumpet sounds, and I'm telling you there's going to be when the trumpet sounds, and the bride of Christ, the dead in Christ will rise first. Do you know that there's a time coming when the sun will no longer shine, and the moon will lose its light, and the seven seas in the world will be turned to blood. That is the period of tribulation. When you go to your tent, there will be blood in your tent. Coming out. There will be darkness on the face of the earth because nature will be revolting. The Bible says the whole of creation has been in anger and, and groaning to be liberated. To be liberated. And it's waiting for the true sons and daughters of God to arise. Yeah. And be the standard in this hour. Be the standard. Be who God has called you to be free yeah. in Him. Die for every sin. But that is the hour. Every prophecy in the Word of God has been fulfilled. Every hour. Every prophecy. And you and I don't have to stay behind in that tribulation. I don't have to be here when I need to open my tap and there's blood in my tap. I want to be so weak with the groom. I want to be somewhere. That day is coming. Did you ever think the day of persecution of Christians was coming? No, but the day came. Did you ever think 200 girls would just disappear and right across the world now Islamic extremists chopping up people's heads and Christians? Christian. Yeah, those Christian girls have been converted to Islam against their will. Where, what is it, the hijab or what? Yeah. Yeah. They have been. Did you ever think those things came to pass? Open the voice, open the sun, sword. Open the sword. What do you see? Children killing mothers. The last thing in the week, I'm, that's why I killed her or that's why I killed them. Demonic, the forces of darkness have been released. The enemy knows the time is short. His time is short. The enemy knows. So just as well as this, as you think you know, we've been hearing the coming of the Lord. Close at hand is the coming of the Lord. You've heard that for years. I'm telling you, it's coming to pass. Remember what the Lord did with Israel years ago when they disobeyed and they rebelled. And God scattered them amongst, amongst the nations of the earth. If you go to any country now, you will find what? Jews. All over. But the Lord says in the last days, I'm going to return them. I'm going to return them to the country. Guess what? Never before have you seen Jews return. Plains and plains and plains of flock Jews are returning to their homeland. Getting ready. In 1967, uh, the people of Israel became the Jewish state and became independent. 1967, and it's believed. That was never, that was prophesied that a nation will be born in one day. That nation was born in one day. If you look on the map, you see how small Israel is. Compared, surrounded by Arabs. But they cannot be taken out because God promised them to the Israel because of the Jewish people. He promised them that when God makes a covenant promise, he does not go back on his promise. 
can come with whatever they want to. But God's promise and God's word. You see, the flowers fade, the grass fades. You and I will not be here one day. But the word of our God will endure forever.